It's the 21st of July 1933 in Germany. The Nazi party has recently taken hold of the country and racial prejudices are ripening. Among those who feel the hate are the Sinti, a type of Romani or Roma people that are often branded as gypsies. One Sinti man has felt the impact of this on his life already, but he can take a hit. His name is Johann Trommen, and he's a professional boxer known for his wiry, tree-like figure and prancy yet hard-hitting fighting style. An early 1900s Muhammad Ali. In this new repressive Germany, Trollman's been told that the way he fights is un-German, un-Aryan. They've even threatened to strip him of his boxing license should he continue to practice his so-called gypsy dancing in the ring. So tonight, with the rebellious smirk, he gives the Nazis exactly what they want. The crowd at Bockbier Brewery in Berlin goes absolutely wild as Trollman climbs into the ring to face down his formidable opponent, Gustav Eder. Many are booing Trollman while others are likely too afraid to cheer. And that's because he's bleached his hair blonde and powdered his skin white, transforming himself into the Aryan those blasted Nazis wanted him to be. The gong tolls and the fight begins, though it has very little to do with boxing. In this episode, we tell a tale of boxing, bravery, and tragedy, backdropped by the fall of the Weimar Republic and the rise of Nazi Germany. So, without further ado, here's the story of a man and a boxing career crushed by Hitler's rise to power and the Second World War. Johann Wilhelm Trommen was born on the 27th of December 1907 in a village called Wilsche near the city of Gifhorn, Germany. He grew up in Hanover, however, along with his eight German Sinti siblings, and after schooling every one of them with his fists, decided to take up boxing at just eight years of age. It was around then that his parents gifted him the nickname of Rukali, meaning something along the lines of an even beautifully grown tree. Young Tolman developed an agile boxing style, wearing down his opponents with his swift footwork and then delivering the pain when they were exhausted. In 1928, when Trollman was either 20 or 21, he was denied the opportunity to fight for Germany in the Amsterdam Summer Olympics because he didn't, in quotation marks, fight like a German. Taking that blow like a champ, Trollman moved to Berlin to pursue a professional boxing career. From 1929 to May 1933, he won 29 of 52 fights. It was around this time that the Nazi part started influencing boxing in the country renaming it German Fist Fighting and excluding and persecuting non-Aryan athletes. However, due to Tolman's fame, he was not swept immediately under the rug and continued boxing for about a year. One fight affected his attitude more than any before it though. On the 9th of June 1933, Tolman squared off against Adolf Witt for the German light heavyweight title, replacing a Jewish boxer who had fled shortly before the fight in fear of his life. Tolman danced about Witt and picked him apart with swift strikes. But it wasn't Tolman's arm that the referee raised at the end of the fight, for the Nazis were pulling the strings. The crowd booed, threatening a riot, so the Boxing Federation caved, awarding Tolman the victory he had clearly earned. But this was Nazi Germany we're talking about, and they stripped Tolman of the title the following week, stating simply that his performance had been insufficient. For his very next fight, they put Tolman up against the terrible Gustav, whom the Nazis probably hoped would cave in Tolman's skull. The gong tolls. Tolman, opposing everything the crowd has seen of him before, walks into the center of the ring, letting Gustav get right into striking range. This is German fist fighting now, and if the Nazis want Tolman to fight like a German, he's going to do just that. He eats a jab, then a stiff right. A left hook glances off his right forearm as he blocks, sending a cloud of white powder into the air. Feet glued to the floor, body rigid, Tolman makes a mockery of the German fighter, trading blows with Gustav like two thugs in a drunken bar fight. Gustav throws a right to the body. Tolman cops it and follows with an uppercut and a left hook, 
catching his opponent in the jaw and temple. Tolman sees stars and he cops a left hook in turn. His ears ring, his knees shake, but he won't go down yet. Blow for blow, the two men work each other like punching bags and the rounds blur together until, eyes swollen half shut, the taste of blood in his mouth, Tolman takes a hit that drops him on the canvas. He's down and the fight might be lost but the war is far from over. No, for the Sinti and for every man, woman and child the Nazis will soon attempt to erase from the face of the earth, it's only just beginning. That was really just the start of Tolman's story and it got a whole lot more tragic after his fight with Gustav. In June 1935, Tolman got married and had a daughter. That same year, the Nuremberg race laws were set in place, forcing many Sinti to abandon their homes and live out in camps and open fields. It was around this time that Tolman was thrown into Hanover Allen labor camp. When he was released, he divorced his wife and waved goodbye to his young family forever, hoping to protect them from further persecution as a result of his Sinti heritage. To avoid being sent to a concentration camp, he also agreed to have himself sterilized. Then the Nazis delivered him the icing on the cake, conscripting him to fight for the Wehrmacht just a few months after Germany stunned the world with its invasion of Poland. In 1941, he was participating in the invasion of the USSR when he was wounded. It was around then that the Wehrmacht tightened its racial laws, expelling Sinti and Romani people from its ranks. When Tolman returned to Germany, however, he was arrested and thrown into Neuengamme concentration camp where they worked him like a dog and made him fight like one too. Initially, Tolman had been able to hide his identity, but word eventually got out. The SS soldiers running the camp made him raise his fists and fight at least one of them every day after he'd finished a 12 hour shift of grueling forced labor. He held his own to an extent. One day though, after they'd relocated Tolman to one of the satellite camps, the guards made him fight a capo, which was a prisoner assigned to supervise other prisoners. This man, Capo Emil Cornelius, was understandably despised by all the prisoners, so there's no doubt that they cheered when Tolman, having lost 30 kilograms at this point, wiped the floor with him. This would be Tolman's last fight though. Feeling more than a little sour after his defeat, Cornelius waited until Tolman was exhausted from a day's work and then beat him to death with a truncheon. It was around March or April 1944 when this happened, meaning Tolman lived to be just 36. It took half a century, but Tolman's story was told and his life honored. In 2003, the German Boxing Federation renamed Tolman as the winner of his fight against Adolf Witt, and since then, a number of memorials have been erected in his name. We're interested to know what you think though. Had you heard of Johann Tolman before this video? Do you think dressing up as an Aryan to fight Gustav Eder was brave or stupid? And lastly, how badly do you want to step on Capo Emil Cornelius's throat? Let us know all that and more in the comment section below. The year is 1942. The Imperial Japanese Army has spread throughout the Philippines and recently crushed the bulk of the Filipino and American defenders on the Bataan Peninsula, taking 75,000 POWs. But the horrors of the Japanese occupation are only just beginning. In the barangay of Anao in the municipality of Mexico, a beautiful young Filipino woman with a head of frizzy hair can only watch as a Japanese officer, backed by a contingent of sadistic troops, parades her father down the street in chains. His body is ruined, bearing signs of torture, and when they're bored of parading the men around, they escort him to the town square and execute him. The young woman swallows her scream. Inside, her reality is shattering. As they string her father up, a warning to all who oppose the Japanese occupation, she studies the officer who orchestrated all of this. The image burns into her brain, she takes one final look at the man who raised her, and then she flees for her life. But only for the time being because she knows she can't avenge her father if she's dead. We return to World War II to tell the tale of a female Filipino guerrilla commander who deserves far, far more attention. 
Her deeds not only represent the unwavering resilience of the Filipino people, but also changed the way women were viewed in the country overall. This is the story of Kumanda Liwawai. As you may have guessed, Kumanda Liwawai, meaning Commander Dawn, was a name she acquired in her time as a guerrilla fighter, not at birth. Her birth name was Remedios Gomez, and she was born in 1919 in the Philippines. While her family possessed some land, her father, Basilio Gomez, was a real character among the peasants and eventually became their mayor. Growing up, Remedios helped support her family by selling rice and sewing dresses, specializing in embroidery. She loved pretty clothes, perfume, makeup, and dancing, and often rode around town on a horse. Remedios flourished into a beautiful young woman and her beauty was celebrated by all, but looks can be deceiving. In December 1941, just after they attacked Pearl Harbor, the Japanese invaded the Philippines, forcing the bulk of its military to surrender on the 9th of April the following year. While the military may have surrendered, the Filipino people refused to bow down. Some 260,000 guerrillas contested the occupation right up until the Allies liberated the islands in September 1945. In 1942, Remedios' father, the vice mayor at the time, was busy organizing an armed resistance when he was betrayed by a fellow Filipino and captured by the Japanese who tortured him before killing him in front of everyone. Fearing that they would be captured too, the Gomez family, including Remedios' mother and seven siblings, fled to the province of Talak. Here, a friend of Remedios' father met with Remedios and told her all about the newly formed People's Army against the Japanese, or the Hukbalahap, or just the Hooks, a newly formed communist guerrilla movement. Remedios jumped at the idea, and when her mother found out, she spoke to her son Oscar about it, saying, Your sister is a woman. I cannot stop her. So, can you accompany her and look after her? He did and his sister soon earned the nickname Liwawai. Initially, Liwawai tended to the wounded and sick. That didn't mean she didn't learn how to fight and kill though. Watching her work and train and knowing full well about her burning desire to avenge her father, the Hooks soon put her in command of a guerrilla unit of her own. This was when the title Kumanda was added to her name. It wasn't long before Liwawai proved herself in battle, before which she often, if not always, put on perfume, polished her nails, and completed the look with red lipstick. According to her biography written by her younger brother Andrew, her appearance inspired her men and motivated them to fight harder. Liwawai, while aware that her dolling up had the function of boosting her men's morale, did it for another reason too. In her words, one of the things I am fighting for in the hook movement is the right to be myself. And none of this was superficial. She was an honest-to-God killer. Even the leader of the Hooks, Luis Taruk, vouched for her. In his words, our movement dominated her thoughts and speech. She did not talk of dresses, dancing, or perfumes. She talked of the work to be done, of our organizational tasks, of the obstacles to be overcome. Throughout her time as a guerrilla commander, Liwawai went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Japanese on numerous occasions, often using weapons prized from their cold, dead hands. It is even said that she would ride into an occupied town all alone or with a small force and warn the Japanese to leave or face the full might of the Hooks. One of the more famous engagements she participated in was the Battle of Kamansi. Here, even after every other Hook unit had retreated in the face of a superior Japanese force, Liwawai stayed on, holding her ground until Hook reinforcements arrived. When they finally rocked up, Liwawai's squadron had all but won the battle. She's also credited with having challenged a fellow Hook commander, Commander Katapatan, to a duel after the man told her that, because she was pretty, she should just lie down and let the Japanese have her when they caught her. Her men had to physically restrain Liwawai, otherwise she would have straight up smoked that fool. As for her true enemy, the Japanese, Liwawai checked the face of every officer she had slain or was about to slay, praying she would one day recognize one of the officers who was the a-hole who killed her father. And that day soon came. 
After countless engagements with the Japanese, Commander Liwa Wai now stands over the man who tortured and then murdered her father in front of her. Japanese troops lay in puddles of blood all around her, some still begging for mercy moments before Liwa Wai's men finish them off. She has tunnel vision though, her attention on the officer who is actually still alive. For Liwa Wai, it's better this way. For the officer, not so much. He cowers in a corner, pleading for mercy like his men before him. But did he show Liwa Wai's father mercy? And what about all the Filipinos he's undoubtedly tortured and killed? Mercy, at this point, would be a bullet. Liwa Wai has a better plan. Her red lips lift in a smile, and she orders her men to take the man alive. It's unclear exactly how Liwa Wai exacted her revenge on her father's killer, but when asked, she said, what he did to my father, what he did to us. So we can assume that she didn't let him off with a slap on the wrist. Throughout the Japanese occupation, the Hooks put up a fierce defense, growing to a strength of 15,000 armed fighters by the end of the war. Around 10% of them were women. They also fought against other guerrilla organizations and after the war against the new government, which working with the Americans wanted to arrest the Hooks for being communists. Many civilians died in the ensuing chaos and the Hooks retreated into the mountains. In 1947, Liwa Wai was captured and charged with rebellion, sedition and insurrection. The media loved her though, especially when President Rojas denounced the Hooks as terrorists. To this, Li Wai Wai replied, No, Mr. President, you are wrong. We are only fighting for a decent livelihood. 95% of us are peasants, so I cannot see any reason why the Hooks will terrorize their own families. We the Hooks champion the rights of the peasants. For that little stunt, Li Wai Wai was punished with solitary confinement, but not for long. With insufficient evidence to keep her behind bars, they released her and she rejoined the Hooks until she could no longer endure the strain of fighting. Her retirement probably had something to do with the fact that she found herself a husband with whom she had a son as well. Unfortunately, her husband was killed in a raid by the Philippine Constabulary short after and she was arrested once more. After weaseling her way out of prison all over again, she kept a safe distance from the more combative Hooks settling into civilian life and living to the ripe old age of 95. As always, we're interested to hear what you think. Had you heard of Kumanda Liwa Wai before today? What about the Philippine resistance against Japan? Lastly, would you like us to cover more brave Filipinos in the future? Let us know all that and more in the comment section below. It's daytime on the 12th of April, 1945. A Boeing B-29 Superfortress named the City of Los Angeles soars through the sky over Japan in the wake of the US firebombing of Tokyo. Piloting the propeller-driven heavy bomber is Captain George Simarol, and among the men of his 11-man crew is a radio operator the crew called Red. As well as manning the radio, Red has a second job, dropping phosphorus bombs through a chute built into the B-29's floor. The bomber rattles as Simarul guides it through a patch of turbulence just off the south coast of Japan. Anti-aircraft tracer rounds flash through the sky. Japanese fighters are hot on the bomber's tail. The B-29's gunners let loose and Simarul aims city of Los Angeles for the city of Koryama. Given the signal, Red makes for the chute and pulls the pin from a phosphorus bomb. As he drops it into the chute however, the bomb explodes flash blinding him and rocketing back up the chute into his face. In this episode, we fly on over to the Second World War to tell a tale of the utmost bravery and sacrifice. Let's get stuck into it. Henry Eugene Irwin was born in May 1921 in Alabama and had a rough start to life, growing up in poverty and losing his father when he was just 10 years old. According to Henry Irwin, who we'll just call Red from here on in, I came from a poor family in Alabama, had no high school education, no college, and no money. In July 1942, about six months after the United States joined the Second World War, Red joined the Army Reserve. It would be almost three years before he got to serve his country overseas, however. While he started training as a pilot under the Army Air Forces in 1943, he was ultimately denied his wings because he was deemed unfit to fly. This was a shame, as in Red's words, more than anything, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. 
They trained him as a radio operator and radio mechanic at Keesler Air Force Base instead. After he graduated, Red was assigned to the 52nd Bombardment Squadron, 29th Bombardment Group, 20th Air Force. He served aboard the city of Los Angeles, or as the B-29 was also known, Snatch Blatch. Almost 4,000 of these state-of-the-art planes were produced between 1943 and 1946, and the model cost some 3 billion US dollars to design, equal to about 45 billion today. Red had a great appreciation for these machines, stating it was big, heavy, and fast. It had beautiful, unbroken nose contours. In early 1945, Red left the US to participate in the US bombing raids on Japan. From February to April, he manned the radio as city of Los Angeles rained hell from above, quickly becoming an integral part of a well-oiled machine. In Red's words, for practical purposes, the B-29 was divided into two halves, with part of the crew forward of the bomb bay, the other part aft, connected by a crawl tunnel above the bay. As the radio operator, I sat with my back to the bulkhead in the rear of the front half, looking forward at the flight engineer, the two pilots, and in the very front, the bombardier, who had the best view in the house. We took pride in how we functioned as a crew. On the 9th and 10th of March, the USAAF launched a massive firebombing raid on Tokyo, an operation codenamed Meeting House. A group of 279 bombers of Curtis LeMay's 21 Bomber Commander turned swaths of the city to ash, killing at least 90,000 Japanese people and, in destroying some 270,000 buildings, made a further 1 million Japanese homeless. It's not 100% clear if Red was involved in this specific raid, but it seems likely. About a month later, on the 12th of April, City of Los Angeles was tasked with laying waste to Horegaya Chemical Plant in Koryama on the island of Honshu. Here, the Japanese produced tetrathyl lead, a vital ingredient in aviation fuel. With City of Los Angeles in the lead of the 52nd Bombardment Squadron, 85 B-29s took off from the island of Guam in the Marianas, scheduled to fly over their target just after midday. But not everything went according to plan. A fraction of a second after his flash blinded, the white-hot phosphorus bomb, burning at 700 degrees Celsius or 1300 degrees Fahrenheit, melts through Red's nose like he's made of butter. Smoke explodes into the B-29's interior, obscuring all view. The pain is beyond words, but Red's number one concern is the safety of his fellow crewmen, and he's fully aware that Captain Simaral can't fly if he's choking on and blinded by smoke. The plane dies. Crawling over the deck, Red follows the heat of the still burning bomb and takes it in his hand. Ignoring the pain of the bomb flaying the skin from his palms, and still completely blind, he feels his way around the gun turret toward the co-pilot's window. Before he can arrive there, however, the navigator's table blocks his path. This doesn't phase him. He tucks the bomb between his forearm and body, and as the bomb melts through his ribs, raises the table. With the way clear and his body lit up like a torch, he flings the bomb through the co-pilot's window and then collapses. With the smoke dispersing, Simarol can see once again. He pulls the bomber out of its death dive just 90 meters, or 300 feet, from the ground. That entire ordeal lasted just 22 seconds. When the city of Los Angeles leveled out, her crew rushed to Red's aid, extinguishing his clothes and administering first aid, though pieces of phosphorus still smoldered beneath his skin and would continue to for months. Somehow, Red remained conscious through it all. The only concern he voiced during this time was for the safety of his crew. After a medical stop on the recently captured island of Iwo Jima, where the doctors removed phosphorus particles from Red's eyes, he was transferred to Guam. The medical staff there were convinced he didn't have long. His entire body was terribly burnt. But what Red had done was beyond phenomenal, more than deserving of the US Army's highest decoration. The aforementioned Major General Curtis LeMay approved Red's Medal of Honor and flew to Red in a matter of hours, presenting the medal himself. During the ceremony, LeMay said, Your effort to save the lives of your fellow airmen is the most extraordinary kind of heroism I know. In answer, Red, who was covered head to toe in bandages, simply said, Thank you, sir. As for his Medal of Honor citation, a portion of it reads as follows. The burning phosphorus obliterated his nose and completely blinded him. Smoke filled the plane, obscuring the vision of the pilot. Groping with his bare hands, he located the window and threw the bomb out. Completely aflame, he fell back upon the floor. 
The smoke cleared. The pilot at 300 feet pulled the plane out of its dive. Owen's gallantry and heroism above and beyond the call of duty saved the lives of his comrades. Red's story wasn't over yet though. Against all odds, he survived his stay in Guam and was soon returned to the US, where over the next 30 months, in almost constant agony, he underwent a total of 41 surgeries, regaining his eyesight and the use of one arm. Much of his face was rebuilt too, though he would wear the scars of his game of hot potato for the rest of his life. Overall, Red's recovery was nothing short of a miracle. A miracle he chalked up to divine intervention, stating, I call on the Lord to help me, and he's never let me down. Red received a disability discharge at the rank of Master Sergeant in October 1947, but did not wholly avoid all things military after that, serving as a benefits counselor at a Veterans Administration Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama for 37 years. Red died at the age of 80 in January 2002. In a letter to this war hero, American General Henry H. Arnold wrote, I regard your act as one of the bravest in the records of war. But what do you think? Was Henry Eugene Irwin's Medal of Honor action among the bravest of the Second World War? How do you think he did what he did? What do you think you would have done? And lastly, can you think of any other stories similar to Red's? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. It's early in the morning on the 29th of November 1942. The Australian corvettes HMAS Armadale and HMAS Castlemaine follow the auxiliary patrol HMAS Kuru through the Timor Sea from Darwin. Their objectives are to deposit and withdraw troops and rescue civilians from around the area of Betano on Timor. A good distance from Kuru, Armadale and Castlemaine come under Japanese air fire, but the Japanese aren't on the money. Their bombs go wide and the Australian ships emerge from the attack unscathed. They press on despite the fact that their enemy is aware of their movements now, and they soon meet Kuru in the sea just off Patano. Kuru is already loaded with evacuees, and Castlemaine's commanding officer makes the decision to take the evacuees from Kuru and ship them to safety in Darwin. As for Armadale and Kuru, they're ordered to push on. On their way in, Armadale and Kuru are strafed by the Japanese, but the Aussies have a mission, and they're sticking to it. At some point in the chaos, the corvette and patrol boat part ways, and at around 2pm on the 1st of December, Armadale finds itself alone with at least 13 Japanese aircraft swooping in for the kill. Aboard Armadale is an 18-year-old Tasmanian by the name of Teddy Sheen, serving as a crewman on an anti-aircraft gun. He and his gun crew steal themselves for the fight of their lives. To do this story justice, we've got to head back in time to the 28th of December 1923 when Edward Teddy Sheen was born. Straight off the bat, Teddy's parents James and Mary were a busy couple. Teddy was their 14th child. He grew up in Latrobe, Tasmania and finishing school worked on some local farms. He was just 16 years old when the Germans invaded Poland, and at 17, inspired by five of his older brothers who had already signed up for the Army and Navy, he volunteered for the Royal Australian Naval Reserve. In February the following year, Teddy was sent to Flinders Naval Depot in Victoria, from where he was posted to a naval base on Garden Island in Sydney Harbour. Here, HMS Kutabul, a converted ferry, served as his home away from home. On the 31st of May, Japanese midget subs crept into the harbour and sank Kutabul. Fortunately, Teddy was on leave at the time and was spared the watery deaths suffered by the 19 men sleeping aboard the vessel. With Kutabul destroyed, Teddy signed on as an Orlikan anti-aircraft gun loader for the Bathurst-class corvette HMAS Armadale. In the words of historian Dr. Kevin Smith, each Orlikon was served by a gun crew of three or four. The gun chief who found the targets, the gunner strapped to his weapon with a waist belt and held firmly in shoulder supports who had the essential role of hitting enemy targets, the loader who fed ammunition drums of 7 inch rounds to the cannon with sometimes a second loader. Each gun crew member trained to serve in all three positions. In August, Armadale left Sydney Harbour for escort duties and then she sailed for Darwin from where she began her treacherous mission to Timor. And that brings us back to the moment those 13 plus Japanese aircraft attacked the solitary corvette. In the kill zone of 9 Japanese fighters and 4 Japanese bombers, Armadale begins performing evasive zigzag maneuvers while her anti-aircraft guns, including Teddy's 20mm Orlikon, open fire. 
All Teddy can hear is the akak of his orlicon and the clatter of the Japanese machine guns as the fighters strafe the deck. Air support isn't coming. Help isn't coming. After about 45 minutes of desperate maneuvering and covering fire, two Japanese torpedoes streak into Armadale's port side. One of the ensuing blasts tears the radio room to shreds, severing all communications. At this point, the corvette is listing and billowing smoke into the air, and men are in the water, drenched with fuel oil. But the Japanese don't care. They strafe them just the same. The order is given. Abandon ship. Teddy and his crew abandon their gun and make tracks over the tilting deck toward the vessel's motorboat. A fighter soars past and the air is punched from Teddy's chest. Watching his comrades die all around him and his blood welling from the two bullet holes in his torso, Teddy makes a bold decision. He drags himself back to the aft anti-aircraft gun, straps himself in and unleashes hell on the Japanese. One burst of fire is good. An enemy aircraft spirals down in front of a cloud of smoke. Armadale's descent isn't showing any signs of slowing. Salt water floods the deck, stinging Teddy's wounds, but he doesn't let up, damaging a further two enemy planes and staving off the Japanese attack with every ounce of strength that he has left. Even as the Orlicon, with Teddy strapped firmly into it, goes below the waves, he's still spitting rounds. The survivors can only watch as their comrade Teddy Sheen thinking only of them, is claimed by the sea. Despite Teddy's sacrifice, just 49 of the 149 people aboard Armadale survived the encounter. Many died in the attack, while others succumbed to thirst, hunger, exposure, and sharks while they drifted from the sea grave of Armadale in lifeboats, awaiting rescue. Many of those 49 survivors, however, claim they would have certainly joined the dead if it weren't for Teddy's actions. According to Russell Caro, who was among the survivors, none of us who survived will ever forget his gallant deed. When the order abandoned ship was given, he made for the side, only to be hit twice by the bullets of an attacking Zero. None of us will ever know what made him do it, but he went back to his gun, strapped himself in, and brought down a Jap plane, still firing as he disappeared beneath the waves. And Caro was far from the only man to witness Teddy's heroism. In the words of survivor William Lamshed, I was now in complete panic as my ship was sinking in front of my eyes. The rear section was leaning on an angle when the Orlikon gun started firing and I saw traces actually hitting a dive bombing Zero which flew over my head and disappeared into the sea. A brilliant bit of shooting, considering the deck was at such a steep angle and that the gun was still firing as the ship sank under the water. Now, don't these sound like the actions of a Victoria Cross winner to you? They sure do to us, but for making the ultimate sacrifice, Teddy was acknowledged with merely a posthumous mention in dispatches. His friends and family were not satisfied with that, and so began a 78-year battle for the recognition the 18-year-old warrior deserved. In 1991, the Victoria Cross for Australia superseded the British Victoria Cross as the highest award for Australian military personnel. In 2001, a bill to have a Victoria Cross for Australia bestowed upon Teddy was rejected, and a decade later, an inquiry conducted by the Defence Honours and Awards Appeals Tribunal concluded that, once again, there was insufficient evidence to award Teddy a posthumous VC. In 2019, another inquiry was undertaken, and this time with a positive result, but the Minister for Defence rejected it at the next stage. It wasn't until June 2020, via an expert panel commissioned by Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison, or as we Aussies call him ScoMo, to re-examine the issue, that the VC was finally approved. The award was presented to Teddy's nephew later that year. It's also important to note that the Royal Australian Navy named one of their Collins-class submarines HMAS Sheen in 1999, in their hero Teddy's honour. We're interested to know what you think though. Had you heard of Teddy Sheen before today, what do you think you would have done in his situation? And lastly, do you think you should have been awarded the posthumous VC? Please feel free to share all your thoughts in the comment section below. It's the 12th of October 1937 in the city of Bangor, Maine. A 30-year-old American man by the name of Walter Walsh stands behind the counter at Darkin's Sporting Goods Store on Central Street a selection of firearms behind him. 
A man walks in, and Walsh recognizes the SOB as James Dalhover of the infamous and murderous Brady Gang. The thing is, Walsh doesn't actually work at Darkin's sporting goods store, and Dalhover's about to find that out the hard way. Walter Walsh, an FBI agent, US Marine, World War II veteran, Olympic shooter, and to the very last day of his nearly 107 year long life, a straight up badass. Walter Rudolph Walsh was summoned to Earth to clean up the streets in May 1907. Growing up in New Jersey, he shot pegs from his aunt's clothesline with a BB gun and rats in the local dump with his neighbor's 22. Walsh's daddy presented him with his first rifle, a 22 caliber Mossberg, when he was just 12, and four years after that, he lied about his age to join the Civilian Military Training Corps. In 1928, Walsh joined the National Guard and started shooting competitively. He went on to win a range of tournaments, including the American Legion Championships, the Small Ball Wimbledon, and the Leech Cup. He also studied law at the same time and graduated from Rutgers Law School in 1934. Combining his brains and dexterity, he then applied for the FBI and got in, and was soon operating out of an office in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. The FBI didn't waste any time putting this hot new talent who carried a pair of 357 Magnums as well as a Colt 45 to the test. In November, Walsh found the festering corpse of Babyface Nelson, the notorious FBI agent killer, in a ditch on the side of the road. In January 1935, Walsh chased the murderer Doc Barker until Barker slipped on some ice and fell prone. Walsh pressed his Colt into Barker's ear and cuffed him. Barker was pissed that he'd been arrested by, quote, a damn babyface kid. That very same day, Walsh and some other agents raided the Chicago hideout of the bank robber Russell Slim Gray Gibson. When Gibson tried to flee down a fire escape armed with a Browning automatic rifle, he came face to face with Walsh and let off a shot. In Walsh's words, he shot high, I didn't. But Walsh wasn't all about shooting and killing. In 1936, he married a woman named Kathleen Barber, and they went on to have two sons and three daughters. It seems he wasn't firing blanks. A couple years after Walsh married Barber, the infamous bank robber and murderer, Alfred James Al Brady, and two of his gang members rocked up in Bangor to buy a few Thompson machine guns from Darkin's sporting goods store, wanting to pay for the weapons in rolls of cash. The owner was more than a little sus of the cash, and told the Brady gang he'd order the firearms in and they could come and collect them in a few weeks. The owner then contacted the police and the FBI set up a trap, with Walsh posing as a clerk behind the counter and a number of other agents hiding in the store and over the road. On the 12th of October 1937, James Dalhover entered the store. Not a moment after Dalhover steps into the store, a group of FBI agents close in on him and, despite his protests, manhandle him to the back of the store and out of sight. As they're doing so, Walsh asks Dalhover where his buddies are, to which Dalhover replies, my pals are right outside. Readying his cult, Walsh advances to the front of the store, where, through the glass, one Clarence Schaefer is staring back at him. The barrel of Schaefer's gun is staring at Walsh too. Both men fire. The glass shatters. A bullet rips through Walsh's thumb and destroys his colt. Another bullet goes through his chest and into his lung. Walsh tosses the colt and, with his left hand, unloads on Schaefer with one of his 357s, wasting him. Gunshots echo through the street outside. Despite his wounds, Walsh steals himself and, stepping outside, joins in a firefight between Al Brady and the FBI. Walsh's fellow agents fill Al with lead, but Al's still moving and firing back. Walsh steadies his weapon and squeezes the trigger, and Al Brady drops dead. Recovering from his injuries, Walsh stayed on as an FBI agent while also shooting competitively, winning a number of tournaments and awards, including the DuPont Trap Shooting Trophy. During his time in the FBI, he put down as many as 17 criminals in one-on-one -on -one gunfights. In 1938, with the situation heating up in Europe, Walsh signed up for the Marine Corps Reserve. When things reached a boiling point and the US marched into the Second World War, Walsh trained the Marine Scout Snipers. This was all well and good, but Walsh was a man of action and wanted some. 
He eventually got his wish, serving in the 1st Marine Division in the Bloody Battle of Okinawa, which lasted from April 1945 to June 1945. According to Vietnam veteran Dick Culver, a Silver Star recipient who served with Walsh later in Walsh's life, Walsh was probably one of the most deadly Marines I had ever served with. In the Okinawa invasion, eyewitnesses watched him shoot a Jap between the eyes with a 45 automatic through a bunker aperture at 75 yards. According to an article by Bill Vanderpool in the magazine NRA American Rifleman, Walsh was with the Marine Patrol when a firefight started. As the Marines were firing back, they heard the steady blast of a 45 in perfect timed fire, an enemy soldier down with each shot. When World War II was over, Walsh served in northern China for a little while and then went home and rejoined the FBI. After about a year away from the military, he signed back up for the Marine Corps and was placed in command of a battalion. Throughout this time, he continued shooting competitively, winning the Marine Corps Pistol Championship, among many other competitions. Having more than proven he was a crack shot, Walsh was put in charge of teaching marksmanship to the Marines. In 1948, Walsh competed in the Summer Olympics in London, placing 12th in the men's free pistol at a range of 50 meters. In 1952, he won a gold medal with the US team in the ISSF World Shooting Championships 25 meter center fire pistol event and a silver medal in that same event for individual shooters. About 10 years later, with plenty of training experience under his belt, Walsh became the commanding officer for the Weapons Training Battalion of Quantico. He stayed there until he retired in 1969, but retirement didn't mean his shooting days were over. Walsh captained the US team in the 1996 Switzerland ISSF World Shooting Championships and won the Outstanding American Handgunner Award the following year. According to the aforementioned Bill Vanderpool, Walsh was firing guns at least as late as his 100th birthday. Even at this age, he could see like a hawk and was in exceptional physical shape, so much so that he lived almost to his 107th birthday, falling just five days short. When asked about his longevity in his later years, Walsh said, to start with, you have to be lucky. Then if you listen to your parents and follow the path of the straight and narrow, then I think God has mercy on you. It has worked very well for me for a long time. His son, Walter Jr., no, not that Walter Jr., had this to say about his father. Dad never attached much importance to praise or sought it. His typical comment at such times was, I was just one who was at that place in time to do a job as well as I could, nothing more. Of course, we'd love to know what you think. Had you heard of Walter Walsh before today? Do you know anything else about his long life we didn't cover in this video? Lastly, are there any other FBI agents or similar law enforcers you would like us to cover? If so, who? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comment section below. And as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I hope you learned something new.